Thank you so much to the amazing volunteers and the board. It's like pretty unbelievable that we're here. Pretty incredible that we made it through two years of kind of fallow and yeah, that we're in a physical space. So yeah, just really appreciating that, <clears throat> that we are rebuilding a community. It's really sweet. Yeah. And the last time, uh, two weeks ago when I was here live, just even with all of our bloopers, which maybe will happen tonight because we are just still figuring out the online and in person. We're so awesome. And yeah, really, really delighted to be with you all. So we're continuing on this book, whether or not you've ever seen it, not a problem that this is our, our source material. Again, this is a book that <clears throat> the teacher Mathieu Ricard put together. And it is his selections of uh, the teachings that are the most supportive for him as he progresses along the spiritual path. <clears throat> so we're quite on our way through the book at this point. I was just looking at the, the chapter. So we started with turning the mind to the spiritual path and then the foundations of practice. And now we're on to the main path. And we have spent the last two weeks on this idea of being a hermit. And if you were here for the last two weeks, wonderful. But if not, just a reminder that the practice of being a hermit is something we can engage with all the time. I mean, certainly these texts here and these selections are intended for being able to cultivate the space to truly go away for a week, for a month, for a year, for 10 years. But we can think of the principles of how we hold ourselves in that kind of retreat of being a hermit into our everyday life. It's really interesting advice that uh, we'll be finishing it today. But when I was reviewing it, it, it really inspired me to think of, again, can each practice that we sit, can we have that kind of dedication as though we had packed our bags and handled our affairs to truly leave, to leave all the worldly concerns, all the worldly pulls on us, and to go into a retreat for just one sit. Really hard to do, right? And, and that's the goal for every sit. It's not, tonight is not special, but we really try to have that sense of discipline and prioritization of commitment and clarity. And so, if you're, <clears throat> if you're like myself, it's a lot of things, a lot of worldly concerns on my mind, right? Some are my own to attend to, some are those of I, who, people I care about. And then of course, the bigger issues of our world. It's really hard to just kind of cut those ties, to have that practice of in this, in this sit, none of that matters. As you often hear teachers say, let your worries go. They'll be there when you get back. And you're like, yeah, thanks. I know. And I can't let them go. And it's, it's really tough. Um, it is really tough for us to be able to take that kind of investment into our practice. One thing I think is really helpful to do is to notice what are the worldly concerns that are showing up for us? It's amazing how when we can look directly at something, a thought or a memory or an image, we can often just see it as is said, self-liberate. Like all of a sudden, it doesn't have that pull of kind of tugging at us from the side. Many of you are familiar with a labeling practice, a practice in which we just apply a simple label to our thoughts, sometimes emotions, other images. And with that practice, I think we get a really great opportunity to practice both this idea of, of leaving things behind by directly looking at what it is that's coming up as much as possible releasing. It's so interesting. I'm, I'm curious, and we'll talk about it after the sit, but to notice if possible exactly what it feels like when we can let something be. Right, so sitting here, and I might think maybe the first thing that comes to mind, oh, wow, that email I didn't send. But if I see it and I let it be just that, like, what is the experience? And I'm using this hand gesture. Of course, this is just concept, but a lot of it is like the, what is called in psychology, decentering. 
giving ourselves a space away from what's happening in the moment. Otherwise, the alternative that we all know very well is just being like face planted into your experience. What's called cognitive fusion, right? Like I am thinking of that email, I'm pretty much rehearsing it in my mind. I have like all the words, maybe I'll edit it, um, right? So just that decentering. It's so interesting. And I think I shared this, I'm sure I've shared this before. It's an instruction by my teacher of leaning back in the mind. That's just one way. There are so many beautiful metaphors people use to create that kind of openness or spaciousness. Often you're, you'll hear people say, like the clouds passing through the sky. So I'll be curious in this practice when we're labeling to just notice or note what is the quality of being able to see this memory, thought, image, and then let go. So be curious about that in our practice. And that curiosity will help you because there are not, there's not gonna be an end to these thoughts and memories and images as we practice. And we will face plant and get carried away. So how do we refresh our interest? I really think this is a, a quality that we've talked about here before but our practice should be so curious so curious we have intention and we have curiosity and bringing those into our practice so then we're not having this agenda and expectation we're really really curious so with that epic preamble let's go ahead and give ourselves some space for practice finding a posture that can support you for the next 20 or 30 minutes. And in this posture, it might be the exact same posture that you practiced this morning or another time. But in this practice right now, imagine you really had arrived at a little hermitage or maybe a cave some space where you had left everything behind. Just imagining that sense of really being able to relax the mind. Someone is at home feeding your cat. Someone is watering the plants. There are no more emails to send. Just imagine Maybe the sense of mind, the feeling of presence. And feel that in the posture. Some kind of discipline and commitment to give ourselves the space and time for this practice. These are the qualities that will help us and support us. Let's begin by settling our body in its natural state. Feeling the qualities of stability and stillness. Feel the support of the body from the chair or cushion beneath you. And 
We feel or imagine your attention and awareness descending away from the busyness of the mind into the ongoing present moment, which is always where we are when we are in our body. Certainly thoughts or ideas may already be emerging as much as possible, giving yourself this opportunity to just settle further. And it can help settle our mind by focusing on the natural rhythm of the breath. As you're breathing in, simply know that you're breathing in. And as you're breathing out, simply know you're breathing out. Engaging curiously our attention to follow the breath. If we can find ourselves following the breath for one complete cycle, we might experience a sense of silence, a settling of our inner speech. Our body may experience a bit of ease and relaxation as we settle to the sense of stability, stillness, moments of silence. Let's also invite the quality of a settled mind, which in addition to relaxation feels vivid and clear. On our inhale, focusing on this quality of vividness and clarity while on our exhale, relaxing and releasing.
how simple, how perfect. Just following the breath, coming back, following the breath, coming back. Let's take a moment here to shift our attention away from the breathing body to consider, shine a light on our intention for being here. Considering what qualities we might want to cultivate individually in support of our collective well being. It is often said the intention is the most valuable part of our practice. Helps point us towards the meaning and purpose of our time here in this moment. And the greater energy of this life. And allowing the intention to feel maybe light or warm, but releasing the specific words. Let's come back and have our main anchor once again be the breath. And for this part of our practice, we'll apply simple labels to our thoughts. We'll be noticing the breath, inhale, exhale. And a thought, a memory, an image spontaneously arises without us trying, asking, or even wanting. As much as possible with curiosity and some level of detachment, apply a label. This could be very simple, thought, feeling, memory. You can also experiment with more specific, planning, work. And keep noticing after the label, as the mental formation dissipates and dissolves, and then return to the breath.
Sometimes we catch our thought immediately as it arises, like a bubble coming up to the surface. Sometimes we find ourselves completely carried away. Wherever we notice the thought is the perfect moment to label. And then gently notice it's dissolving, no longer energizing it with our attention. So we direct our attention once again to the natural rhythm of the breath. Do not feel discouraged. There is always the next breath. Always a chance to return. Notice if your labeling becomes a bit too energetic, maybe a sense of contraction or anticipation. As much as possible, feel a pliancy of body and mind, focused on the breath, and just simply, elegantly labeling our thoughts as we become aware of them, watching them dissipate, I'm returning to the breath.
for our remaining minutes, re-energize your practice, recommit with full curiosity, being with the breath as your primary anchor, labeling dispassionately whatever arises, whether it is sticky and hard, whether it is an enjoyable fantasy, label it, release it, return to the breath. For our last minutes of practice, release the focus on the breath, release the focus on labeling, and let your awareness be vast as space. Thank you for your practice. Felt so good to practice with you all. Thank you. Such a difference. Though on screen, we can feel your love too. (laughs) Any questions or reflections, especially on that invitation to notice what it's like to 
release the thought, the memory, the mental formation. Anything you noticed or any questions? We have a mic here for those who are here, which would be wonderful. Do you have a question? And Noam, if folks online have that, maybe you can just, I, I can see you very well, so you can let me know. Claudia? First time in the space, in the physical space, uh, Zoom folks, and it's wonderful. And I just noticed um, how much easier it was for me to really let go, noticing and let go. I actually, trying to practice at home, oftentimes get pretty frustrated because I do get distracted quite a bit. And I'll be honest, I'll confess, sometimes I give up and I say, oh, <laughs> what the heck you, you know? So I don't know. I don't know what it is about uh, being in, in the Sangha, you know, in, in the company of you all, but it just feels great. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, letting go was, is very liberating mm. and uh and i was trying to label also and when you said any thoughts or any feelings and i noticed that sometimes they were both together yeah you know it was the thoughts and the feeling that the, the whole package yes <laughs> so anyway um yeah wide variety but thank you thank, thank you. you thank you Anybody notice any common themes among your labeled thoughts? Oh, yeah. Mace plans all the time. Who else relates to that? Who had some planning thoughts? Mm hmm. And did you notice, could you like notice when you released? Yes, I could notice when I released and it was very freeing and relaxing, but it only lasted for like three seconds. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. And then it came back online and was like, oh yes, now that is checked off, that one isn't. Um, yeah, and, and also the mental chatter. I think it took almost until you said, the last remaining minutes and I was like oh I think the mental chatter has finally yeah stopped or at least quieted a little bit and so that was like really relaxing too and Good. just like a, a, you know a break from it was just so nice yeah so, beautiful yeah. yeah and I think you know you see a lot of practices with that oscillation right the focusing in and then the releasing and that can be a really um powerful way for us to experience the spaciousness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can go just straight for the spaciousness, um, but often that oscillation can really help. Yeah, and the first part with the imagine me being in like in a cave or something, I was just re-listening to a Cave in the Snow mm. with um, Tenzin Palma when she spent 12 years in a cave. And so that was fresh in my mind. Mm. So I got to I imagined her little cave that she describes and wow. it, was, it was really beautiful. So Oh awesome. Yeah. 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 Folks in the Zoom room? Any thoughts, questions, reflections? What did you notice? You can still hear us though. 
Okay. So we'll move on then to, to our next passages here. So for those, especially who didn't hear um, the opening, so each chapter on each theme, our path to awakening, Matthew Ricard writes a little bit. And he says interesting parts here. He says, the chaotic situations of ordinary life make it very difficult to progress in practice and develop inner strength. It's best to concentrate solely on training the mind for as long as is necessary. The wounded animal hides in the forest to heal its wounds until it fits to roam again as it pleases. Our wounds are those of selfishness, malice, attachment, and other mental poisons. So that could have been some of our labeling practice, attachment, malice, other mental poisons. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting invitation to us. It essentially says that most of us don't have strong enough willpower to practice amid everyday life. I don't know if I believe it, but I understand that, and I, knew, I know that the benefit of our kind of refreshment when we do practice, even again, if we're practicing for a day or half day with peers, I do think we need a bit more time to drop in. So yeah, I'm gonna read this last passage of this chapter by Dujum Rinpoche, and this is advice for retreat. And it's interesting because paragraph by paragraph is, is quite good material. The first one is <clears throat> understanding that all objects of desire combined with our habitual tendencies are obstacles. Cultivate an attitude of not wanting them. No problem. <laughs> Concerning wealth and possessions, if you don't know how to be contented with just a little, once you've got one, you'll want two and it won't be difficult for the deceiving devil of the desirable objects to enter. Yes, it won't be difficult for the deceiving devil of the desirable objects to enter. And I think, you know, of course, this is worthwhile for a longer retreat, um, but it's also good advice no matter what. It's really this idea of, can we cut through our craving? Can we, actually not give in to mindless wanting more while living in this contemporary culture that we live in that really reinforces more and new and better. It's a radical act, truly radical. And I, I think it's interesting <clears throat> One part of it that I often think about is just how we tire of things. We forget to see like their quality, their goodness, to truly like them and remember them, right? Not always, but it, the allure of something else, it's often associated with our kind of hedonic adaptation to what we already have. So it seems to me that part of this first part of the advice is actually it's asking of us to not want more. Because if we let into that, like, mm, I don't know about you all, but I have spent quite a lot of time on different retreats, like coveting someone else's cushion. <laughs> <sighs> or like, oh man, tomorrow I'm gonna sit in that other side of the room. There's like that heating vent, there's like light from the wind. I'm gonna meditate so well if I'm over there. Right, and, and I just love this. It's like, no, stop, just stop, right? Like stop that. Because the minute you let it in, there's like something, there's something and it'll become many things, right? That we need or that we want. Um, and then the second part is, is quite interesting. It says, whatever good or bad things people might say, don't take them as true. <laughs> Have no hope or doubt acceptance or rejection. Let them say what they will as though they were talking about someone already dead and buried. That's, 
it's interesting idea. I mean, I just I like the kind of evocativeness of that invitation for us. Can we hear someone's advice, which is usually judgment, like, oh, have you thought about this or that? You know, you could really, I mean, that's a nice cave, but have you seen the caves, right? So to not give in, it's another way of cutting through, probably craving in a similar way. I mean, they say explicitly hope or doubt, right? How do we cut through hope or fear? So very often it's talked about the mind of hope and fear. That's our, our rocket pack to samsara. I really want it like this. God, I hope it's not like that. So one way we do that is to just as much as possible, once we've committed to retreat, again, whether that's sitting down for one practice or committing ourselves to a month or longer, no more hope and fear, no more advice. You've gotten what you needed. You are where you are. This is not saying advice is never good. In the context of our practice, it's not needed, right? If we've committed to it. Um, no one but a qualified guru not even your father or mother can give correct advice. Therefore, keeping control over your own actions, do not hand your nose rope to others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Outwardly good natured, you should know how to get along harmoniously without burning their noses. So the I don't know what that means. I think it is, you know, you don't need to succumb to others judgments and you don't need to be rude about it. Right. So you're not listening. You're not seeking advice, but you're also not like I'm so beyond like I'm on I'm going on retreat. I don't need to hear what you have to say. Like be just steadfast in your ability to know this is right. This is what I've chosen. Mm -mm -mm. But in fact, if anyone superior or inferior comes to hinder your practice, you should be unshakable, like an iron boulder pulled by a silk scarf. It won't do to be a weak character whose head bends in whatever direction the wind blows like grass on a mountain pass. And I think this idea of a character of determination, you know, it's, it's, it's an important part of the practice, no matter what, which is again, cultivating discipline and not discipline as in something that you did something wrong, I am disciplining you. But discipline is this very noble calling. I know what I'm prioritizing and I'm gonna to stick to that. That is, that is an essential part that will allow us to go on retreat. There's never gonna be a good time for any of us because we're humans in the world to just pull out whatever we're doing and take time to practice. And so I think, you know, that's, that's kind of reflected here. Like Dujum Rinpoche knew that there's always going to be advice. Like, oh yeah, retreat. Gosh, but maybe next year when the family's, you know, harvest or business is doing a little better. And you're like, it's my time. Like there's always going to be. Um, so I, I really like that idea of being kind of steadfast, unshakable like an iron boulder pulled by a silk scarf, meaning won't get pulled very far, right? For any practice, the moment you begin until you reach its ultimate end, whether lightning strikes from above, there's car alarms in the street, I'm kidding, um, a lake springs up from below or rocks fall from all sides, having sworn not to break your promise, even at the cost of your life, you should persevere until the end. That's the hyperbole you like, right, Mace? <laughs> but I, <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, I, I like it though in the context of practice and, and practicing as we are in a very urban Dharma center, right? So when you sit down to practice here, you're sitting down to practice, you know, no fussing about what's going on out there. Like, this is what you're doing. From the very beginning, you should come progressively to an established schedule of periods of practice, sleep, meals, and breaks, allowing no bad habits. 
Whether, you practice, whether your practice is elaborate or simple, you should make it even and regular, never sporadic. Not even for an instant should you leave any room for the ordinary. Very strict, but again, like he's he's not talking out of nowhere. He's talking out of experience, right? Like the sense that if I'm going to do this retreat, it has to have so much structure or I will dawdle or I will just like get caught up like counting the spider webs on the cave, right? And I know for myself, when I got to do personal retreat a lot more these last two years, I had like a very rigid schedule. And the moment it started to waver, the rest of the day was lost, right? So 30 minute walking, 30 minutes sitting, 30 minute walking, 30 minutes sitting, 30 minute journaling. And then maybe I need to make lunch and it takes a long time. And then the rest of the day is just not as loose. So I, I like, and I can, at least for myself, appreciate that strict container. And the same for when we're sitting, you know, like you were saying, Claudia, sometimes you sit and you're like, oh, it's not working. I should just have a cup of tea. Like really inviting ourselves to sit. I'm deciding to sit, I'm gonna sit. During a retreat, whether your doorway is sealed or not, you must not speak, not spy, or come face to face with others. Having completely discarded the wanderings of the restless mind, expel, expel the stale breath and correctly assume the essential elements of bodily posture. The mind should rest upon clear awareness without, without wavering, even for the time of a finger snap, like a peg driven into solid ground. So that's tough because hermit retreats are not that easy to come by. For, our, for many of us. But again, as I mentioned two weeks ago, even if you live with other people, you likely can take three or four hours to practice in your room and just have that be what you do. Um, and it's, again, it's interesting, you'll see that many of these suggestions of what we do to be a hermit on retreat involve how we manage relationships. So I, I noticed for myself, a lot of my, my labeling, whether it's a to-do list or otherwise, is about, you know, did I connect with that person? Should I reach out to that person? How is this person? There's a lot of our relationships, our ties to this world, which are so beautiful, which are essential, life-giving, life-prolonging. And yet, for the purposes of, of retreat and to kind of really withdraw from the world, we need the focus to be inward and there to be like no distraction whatsoever so that we can settle in fully, let the mind really, really rest. And for those who've had an opportunity to be on retreat with, with others or with oneself, there's a different quality when we really commit to this. I mean, this is like the strict container, right? <clears throat> I've been on retreats with various levels of container and I, I feel myself somewhat preferring the strict container. So maybe I appreciate this for that reason. Questions, comments on these so far? Is this the kind of container you would like for your retreat? No, we gotta know. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. 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 I think many of us feel that desire for that clarity and that container and that just structure. Um, yeah. In regards to the like, people in the world, I realized a couple months ago that my vagueness of the expectations of those people, mm. the, the, the vagueness of the, woo, of the expectations of the people in my life, be it what do they expect over text? What do they expect in terms of frequency of call? All of that being vague was just bothering me in yeah. the back of my mind. It wasn't clear until I was too busy to handle regular reality that I was just like kind of secretly obsessing about like, did I piss this person off? Did they, yeah. did they think I was going to call? And I was like, I'm not doing emotional crap over text. It, <laughs> it, it, I, it's, it's, it's not worth it. And I got to figure out how to like, 
get the expectations right. So for this, I mean, especially you're going to go away for whatever it is, you know, it can't be vague for, yeah. for me. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I, and I do think, you know, again, relationships are both where we heal and also such a big source of the mind of hope and fear, right? A lot of that and the comparison. Yeah. Yes. I think it's off though. Is it on? Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, to combine your other field of expertise in this. So what if one has a lot of conditioning and neural networks around rigid controlling, following the rules, you know, like the little character in you that's like, you've got to do it right, you got to do it right. It worries me that this exacerbates that. And, and so one of the things that I'm starting to see in my own practice is the way that the practice like the ego just can co-opt fucking anything and it's so smart and all the protectors and like, you know, everybody inside mm -hmm. is like working to maintain the weird stasis that got created. Yeah. Right. Of it growing up in this crazy world. And so it just feels like this is a possibility to not actually undo, mm. but to, to tighten and reify. Yeah, so that's, yeah. 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 I think that's such a great question. And it, it has to do with this text, but in general, like how do we not become or like apply our rigidity, our tightness, our self-criticism to our practice? Was there a hand there? Oh yeah. Nope. There we go. Great. I think it's really interesting. I find the structure, you can be like a little overstructured with retreat, but just like the general structure that was described, I think is actually really helpful because as you move, a, if, if you're like in retreat for a few days, you kind of do start to unravel a little bit. Um, and then the structure of the retreat kind of becomes this raft that mm -hmm. can help maintain you and help mm. the conditioning kind of be more um, supported to be relieved. Mm. Like sometimes I think that's, it's always such an interesting question, especially what Mace was bringing up. Like, when is that? When are we using the structure to like maintain our conditioning? Mm -hmm. And then when is the structure actually supporting the removal or the release of conditioning? Yeah. Right. And I think, I don't know. I, I like the structure personally of retreat. I think it's very helpful. And I do myself because I can be pretty disciplined. I do find I have to kind of let up yep. a little bit yeah. with it yeah, um, and be careful with how much structure is uh, how much structure I will offer myself on retreat. Yeah. And I think it's, it's just, uh, thank you for sharing that. Cause I think there are a lot of different ways that we can experience. Am I even just becoming here for some folks like, like, Oh, I really, we're going to sit for 30 minutes. Like, well, what if I need tea? That's rigid. Right. And there, and uh, <laughs> yeah, also. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. So there was a difference here between strict and structure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was on a retreat two weeks ago where it was a beautiful weekend and we were inside the whole time. And I was like, oh, just wanted to sit outside and, and feel it. So, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, especially like the parts of the structure that support us, like that raft, like that most simple aspect that can buoy us. 
I feel like we can be creative. And again, especially on maybe the longer retreats, that creativity or, you know, like, oh, but there's a different way that can really allow us to just lose our focus and, and, and kind of dissipate the energy. So it really, you know, there's, there is maybe a certain teacher who could really help you see and show you the way, but for most of us, we have to know for ourselves. And since we can't always know, like erring on the side of, I'm just gonna keep it tight. I get it. Um, I'll say one more thing though, Mace on that, cause I think it's, it is a, a problem for many of us who are practitioners and also maybe have some perfectionism or some controlling or some, you know, just desire to succeed, right? To do it right. So how do we work with that? And I do think the curiosity again is, is so important and it's, it's, and it's okay if we're a little rigid. Like I notice my mornings are like my really, you know, precious time to practice. And sometimes, you know, my cat is intervening. Sometimes it's garbage day. Sometimes, you know, there's other things that like get in the way and it can totally ruin the experience of having this hour to write and to practice. And so I think we kind of have to be onto ourselves um, with it. Yeah. Hi, it's nice to see you. I think it's on. Testing one, yeah, two. You got yeah, it. okay. So, um, yeah, I personally found, um, especially the comment on like the sort of Zen hit you with the ruler thing. <laughs> Um, I've found that Buddhism doesn't seem to really have a chapter on uh, what to do if you have a strained relationship with, with authority, like mm. I do. So I really, um, you know, what people are, what you were saying about like, you, you know, make the practice your own, trust your, your own inner wisdom, which is not what you said, but I'm paraphrasing sure, <laughs> through my yeah. own lens. Um, I really, uh, I, th I think that's so um so important and i've like like personally over the past few years i haven't gotten more okay with doing what authority says i've just gotten better at being more polite to authority so that it looks like i'm doing something they're okay with when what i'm really doing <laughs> Mm. when I'm really doing what I feel is most onward leading for myself. Mm. Yeah. That seems wise in general. And actually, I think, yeah, I think we'll get there. One of the last parts of advice um, on retreat, I'll just, I'll skip ahead there and, and we'll come back, is about cultivating devotion. And so we may not actually be able to have devotion for all forms of authority, but the teachings and the qualities of the teacher, if we can't cultivate that, that sense of devotion, we are just gonna kind of be like faking it. That is, it's interesting. There's a, and like devotion is so complicated, misunderstood in so many ways, but I can see the difference between listening to authority and feeling devotion. So I would never, you know, feel I wouldn't want to have like an authority relationship with the teachings. And so that's an interesting um, piece for us. A couple more prompts on devotion, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll read one more passage I think Mace will really like. Uh, a strict outer, inner and secret retreat will quickly give rise to all the signs and qualities. But if for some important reason you meet someone and talk with them, thinking, after this, I shall be very strict. After this transgression, the prosperity of your practice will fade and everything will become slacker and slacker. If at the very start you make a resolute, clear-cut decision to remain seated, making your retreat progressively stricter, your practice won't be swept away by obstacles. And again, yeah, but think, but think about this. This is being a hermit on a retreat on your own, possibly for like years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And yeah, I mean, I think it is, um, you know, the, the longer retreats I've been on have been really strict and it, and it has been hard and I have definitely felt the benefit. So it's, it is, it's interesting about devotion is it doesn't mean, you know, you're like mindlessly following someone. It means that there's like a humility and a surrender. Like, I don't know if this is how I would do it, but actually I really have this sense of interest in these practices. I, I kind of actually more than interest, maybe I have a sense of confidence in these practices. And that's what really gives rise for us. Um, so it says there are many ways of checking the particular qualifications and topography of places, but in general, a place blessed by Guru Rinpoche and the great accomplished masters of the past, which is not in the hands of people who have broken their sacred links is suitable or according to your preference, an utterly, utterly solitary place with favorable conditions, food and other necessities, always forsaking outer entertainments to dwell in non-action is to dwell in the true solitary place. So again, I think, um, how do we help sever our constant preoccupation with our relationships, our to-dos, that social context. And I, I do think, you know, contemporary retreat centers, they may not have the, the blessing per se of, of ancient masters, some of them do, but there is like an agreed upon consensual choice to be there. And there are certain centers you go to and you kind of feel that actually as like a palpable experience, like, oh, there's been a lot of practice here. I um, I was at a retreat center a couple weeks ago, which is so beautiful. It's actually not a retreat center. It's a, a workshop place. Um, so beautiful, like truly just um, elegant and lovely, but it wasn't intended for silent retreat. And I was pretty distracted the whole time, right? There's just, it's, it's a different orientation um, and in how spaces are made. So it says, <clears throat> as for the actual purification, so it's the entire amount of this advice for retreat. It's like seven or eight paragraphs. Only the last one is what you should do to actually practice. So most of it is like the whole setting up. As for the actual purification of your nature, the ordinary aspects are the four mind changes. The extraordinary ones <clears throat> are refuge, generation of bodhicitta, purification of obscurations. Having practiced each of these assiduously according to the commentaries till you've truly experiencing them, you should then consider the most extraordinary guru yoga as the vital essence of practice and perseverance in it. If you do not, growth of meditation will be tardy, and even if it grows a little, it will be vulnerable to obstacles and genuine realization will not be able to take birth in your being. So if you pray with simple and fervent devotion after some time through the transfer of the heart mind realization of the guru and extraordinary realization inexpressible in words will certainly take birth from within. As Lama Shang Rinpoche says, to nurture stillness, experiences and deep concentration, these are common things, but it very rare is the realization born from within through the guru's blessing which arise by the power of devotion. So that's the only mention of devotion in this book. So I thought it would be worthwhile for us to stay there for a while, especially because it is so fraught. And I would be curious, I, there's a lot of variety of experience in this room. What does that mean to any of you? What does devotion mean in the context of your practice or maybe in the context of other associations not so favorable. Also online folks, happy to hear from you on devotion. Yes.
Yes. Um, devotion was always an idea that was really, really fraught for me being raised in a, in a very religious family and attending parochial schools. And devotion was this thing that was um, put up as this ideal Mm. that we were always to be striving towards mm. and it but it was devotion to a very very abstract mm. kind of thing it was the dev devotion to this invisible god and um also to the rules mm. and so that was when I hear the word devotion, it's it's been difficult for me for a very, very long time. But the relationship that I've sort of been able to develop with it uh, in the last several years is when it comes to various teachers in my Buddhist practice, I've um, experienced some real letdown mm. from various teachers over the years and some real, mm. um, some actual betrayal, not personal, <clears throat> excuse me, but to the Sangha in general. Yeah. And um, so that's, but so, so what I've ended up doing is developing a devotion to the Dharma. Yeah. And as that you know, that, that whole idea of don't offer your devotion to the individual yes. or, or to who th their person, though in some cases that may be easy because mm. the vessel is really pure. But, it, but what's, what is absolutely um, pure is the Dharma as it comes forth. Mm. Sometimes the message is really clear and offered in a, in a really wise way, some, sometimes less so. But when the Dharma comes through, the Dharma is, is, is something that's easy for me to, to um, offer my devotion. Hmm. And so when I've been on retreat, the thing that I've always kept in mind is that this is three days, this is 10 days, this is, this is gonna be 14 days, you know, this sit on a, you know, my regular sitting practice or when I'm not necessarily on retreat in a formal sense, it's gonna be 30 minutes. So there's a, I keep in mind the fact that none of this shit is forever mm. so it's it's i can handle it mm. okay and so when you say you can handle it meaning if there's devotion brought up it doesn't upset you or more or that you feel the preciousness of it as devotion at this point in my life i feel the preciousness of yeah. of the devotion because i have a, a really clear sense uh, as to to what I am directing my devotion. Yeah. And yeah. it's not a per it's never a person. Yeah. I'm I may feel affection yeah. for my teachers. But the, de the the devotion is to the Dharma. Yeah. And that's right. You know, that's beautifully said. And that that is appropriate. That's not being transgressive. Right? It is Unfortunately, I think a little bit of an orientation in, in the modern interpretations of Buddhism, though historically too, to really associate the guru yoga or the practice of devotion to the person, not to them as a vessel, as a representation of these qualities. Uh, I heard Alan Wallace talk about guru yoga, this practice of, of devotion. It's like kind of a calling onto bring those blessings to me. I, I want those blessings of the enlightened being. And he said, yeah, I, you know, some people consider me a, a teacher and a, a lama and I'm their guru and I, I am that. And I'm also a human being and, you know, both things. I think we can also have a deep sense of, of devotion to our community. And I do think especially 
a community that in, in this context is one that's communal, right? And I, I really discovered my sense of devotion through how I feel in the natural world. You know, sunset or shadows or movements, like just that like heartbreaking realization of the beauty and knowing there's something more. It's, it's a non-materialist love, uh, not of an object, but of being part of this. And I think, you know, I don't like that counts, but I think it's that heart of devotion. I always say that uh, I think gratitude is, is another one of the gateway drugs to devotion. We appreciate something, we start to kind of revere it. And we start to pay attention more and we're like, wow. Right, so I, I think it's an interesting process and different traditions in Buddhism actually have a, a different kind of process or method for devotion. But one um, approach I, I have found useful is this idea that, and this can, supposedly it's linear, but I think it can, it can come and, and cycle through, which is having the kind of um, interest. Like, oh, these teachings help, I'm interested. Okay, and then having a devotion that's a longing for the kind of spiritual realizations you know are possible that you start to glimpse. I've been in longing for a long time. Like I know, like I'm just like, oh, I want that. I want to be able to like really merge with those qualities. And then there's confidence, which I sometimes experience, right? Of wow, I feel a great devotion and, it's, and I see the, the fruit as well. So I like thinking of it as, you know, not just, you know, throwing down your will, your money, your whatever. It's, it is this um, maybe stepwise phases. I think I saw a hand. Am I crazy about that? Okay, cool. No, yes. Oh, yes, please. I'll go. I, that's, I was thinking the same thing. Devotion is, uh, well, I don't really talk about it or think about it too much. I'm kind of digging the um, the lyrics for the Earth, Wind, and Fire song. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm kind of digging that. You know, I, that's what first came to my mind. I, yeah, that's very lovely, you know. But uh, you you hit it with the confidence, you know. I have confidence in the teachings. Yeah. You know, and I have, I have experience of them working, you know. And, I, and I'm grateful. I have gratitude about that. And it makes me very happy, you know, it's got a kind of a warm feeling, but it, you know, it kind of has to be aroused a little bit. That's why I, I kind of show up at Dharma teachings and, and um, the retreats are lovely. Um, and I, I like the uh, container of being, you know, um, I got a really great benefit out of um, the first couple, all the retreats I've been to, I've got a good benefit out of, but I, I like the, uh, no telephone, no internet, no talking, mm -hmm. uh, don't even read any books. Um, I've been on uh, retreats where uh, it was suggested that don't make any eye contact with anyone. And um, I checked out, um, a, you know, a monastic retreat mm -hmm. where it was a little bit, um, you know, no eating afternoon and no adornment of the body and no, one of the, I think the, the, uh, one of the precepts was no um, lofty beds, no high. I don't, I'm not sure what yes. that is all about. Yep. But, um, I try, yeah. I said, gee, I, can I be a little bit comfortable? You know, I need to, <laughs> I always bring my own pillow on a, on a retreat. But uh, yeah, so it, it's really helpful. And, um, you know, it's like a uh, cleaning up a hard drive, you know, and that, I remember that first retreat I went to, I was, <laughs> and even some of the subsequent ones, I, the mind gets so exhausted yeah. from holding stuff that you get to that retreat, you feel like sleeping for hours and hours, you know? And um, so, yeah, I think it's great. And as far as like the gurus, I don't really do gurus, but I respect them. You yeah. know, I do respect them. I'm not devoted to them. And I don't, you know, they, uh, you know, I had a teacher tell me, you know, it's like they're, um, they don't put anybody on a pedestal and they have clay feet. Yes, play, you know, and so I don't, I don't, I don't do that part of it. But I respect the knowledge that they have, and if they're helping people, I'm, I, I it's really great, you know. So, yeah, yeah, I think thank that's, you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and thank I do you. think the thank you, 
Yeah, the confidence should be, you know, again, like a real, um, like you said, it helps, right? And and there is, again, I do like this word, I like humility and I like surrender. Um, often my teacher will say, can you yield? Can you yield, right? Can you be with? And then, I mean, she she asks a lot too, and, and she is saying, you know, can can you actually be have a sense of devotion to whatever life is asking of you. Because it's interesting, right? Can we be devoted, of course, to the teachings? But if life is teacher, then can we be devoted or feel devotion for life? And it's very uncomfortable, often awkward teachings that are really beautiful. Not in the moment, usually, but sometimes after. We can learn from them. So I, I, I appreciate that as a like an invitation to, to check out. And it's yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I do, as I've mentioned, I have a teacher. I feel a lot of devotion. I never would have seen that one coming for myself. No one asked it of me. I, it's not a formal practice, um, but it is a sense of the great relief, the great benefit that I get. And I certainly um, appreciate sharing knowledge, but I myself, like, I don't want devotion. I don't want to be the recipient of devotion. Respect, that sounds great. So I appreciate that term, like, yeah. And then being a mirror, right? So as Kalyanamitra, as spiritual friends, we show up for each other. And it is sweet to think of a relationship with one another where it is that I and thou, like Martin Buber said, where we have this kind of sacred, holy relationship to each other. Not just, oh, hey, what's up? I mean, that's great. Hey, what's up is fun. But that, I mean, you're here to help me wake up and I'm here to help you wake up. And that's a pretty big deal. So that evokes something more tender, I think closer to devotion, yeah. Egg, please. I uh, have been sitting with this sentiment from Ram Das about we don't worship the gate, we go to the inner inner temple. Mm. And I think a lot of this devotion idea is that we're devote so many times in our culture we're devoted to the gate, mm. we're devoted to the practice, we're devoted to the teacher, we're devoted to the center, which are all, I think, good and beneficial, um, but we lose sight of the inner type temple when we do that. And, mm. it, and that takes me to this idea of the devotion to the finger pointing versus what it's actually pointing at. We get lost. Mm. And I think that's part of the practice. Yeah. Um, mm. And for me, a lot of devotion, I correlate with motivation especially in mm. retreat and some of the things that we started the conversation around uh, leaving things behind, how difficult it is to um, sever the ties from that kind of everyday life um, because the motivation that it will be of benefit to us. Right. And without mm. that, without seeing that, it's going to be hard. It's mm. going to be a struggle. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be right and wrong where it's like, uh, if, if the motivation is that we're doing mm. this, we're on retreat, we're going into the inner temple because it's a benefit, for me, it requires very little willpower. Mm. It's something that I want to do. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. You're bringing up a side of, I'd say, like devotion and even loyalty that's sacred and beautiful. You know, you think of someone who is devoted to their kids, their partner, there is a sense that of like that integrity and clarity of like, this is mine to do. And that is, I think, I do think that's the true practice. And it's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, many of us in this room have in, in, uh, in our lives had betrayal from teachers and it does get, gets complicated, but I don't want it to rob us from that truly tenderizing experience of, of devotion. And again, I think it's interesting to notice where it can be felt and what it might actually feel like qualitatively. Like, again, I said, for me, just the sunsets, I realized I had a sense of devotion. 
to that. So what is it we can feel it for? And maybe it's for our own practice, like Nick was saying, just, wow, I really have a sense of momentum here. Because it's, it's interesting, you know, you read, especially the ancient texts, and <clears throat> they are what they are, but wow, without devotion, it is often said, you may as well not have hands or feet. Like you won't get there. You know, you can't grasp the practice. You can't progress on the path. Like the devotion is like, everything else is technique and method, but without this non-conceptual feeling of total like, yes, like I am for this, it won't light you up. That's how I understand it. Um, I also, you know, <clears throat> some, some of you have gotten to experience Chandra doing chanting, singing. Devotional practice can be chanting, dancing, making offerings. So there might be a way that just feels beautiful. I think there was cookies last week, devotional cookies. There's even devotional cookies this week. But honestly, it's like, what are we imbuing, right? We can imbue some of our activities as devotional too. And I think that's a beautiful way in. I, I say ocean devotion for surfing, right? As a practice of, I mean, it's surrender. <laughs> yeah. So I think that there's ways that we can find devotion. And again, just notice how it nurtures our practice. So yeah, I really appreciate, I was like, I saw that in the book. I was like, oh, guess we're going to have to talk about devotion. But thank you for, yeah, the richness of this conversation. And uh, let's take a moment to dedicate the merit of our practice. So regathering our attention. I'm taking a moment to feel just the immediate benefit of having been in presence together. And as an offering, as an extension of our dedication to this practice, we consider maybe the slightest possibility that some of what we've generated here together tonight could be of benefit. And that maybe our own sense of connection and care could radiate out so that all beings would feel cared for, all, feel, all beings would feel belonging, all beings would be free. Thank you all. It will be me again next week here, just in the person, this person. Yeah, for deepening practice. Next chapter will be very juicy. Nice to see you all. Nice to see Thanks, you all. Eve. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.